We're live, Bruno. We're live. Okay. Hi, everybody. Bruno sat on my mic and turned it off right before we started, but I think we are okay. It's okay, Bruno. You got this. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hi, there's already people here. That's awesome. Okay, Bruno. Sit. <clears throat> Okay, today is the second day in our suit dissection. Last week, we dissected the tie. Toby? Toby, sorry, Bruno. I'm going to have you sit down here, but Toby. <sighs> Anyways, so, hello, welcome. Uh, last week, we dissected the tie, and now it is in pieces here, 10 pieces total, including tags. And tags count as a piece because in manufacturing, you have to consider the tag. It's an important piece of your puzzle. So 10 pieces because it's a round number, but tag does count. Um, so this is the two ties shredded. I'm not shredding two shirts today because that's a waste. But I do have reference shirts so we can kind of compare and contrast because we are working with a... I'll move this microphone over here where I'm talking towards you guys, which makes more logical sense now that it's not in the Bruno danger zone. But, <sighs> oh yeah, this is a luchador mask I made a while ago. I love it. But um, this is the suit that we have. We are, it is a tiny suit. We are on to the shirt portion. So this is a nice teeny tiny shirt. Um, notes. It is a stand collar, two piece stand collar, meaning there's a piece here and a piece here. They're separate and there's a seam in the middle. It is at the close to the neckline measurement. It does not have a reinforced yoke. What is a reinforced yoke? We'll get more into that in a second, though. Um, it has this, let me go close, see if you guys can see it, that decorative pleating right here. And pretty sparkly buttons. It's pretty rectangular. There are definitely curves at the sleeves. But other than that, it just goes straight down. The sleeves are pretty straight. It has just a regular cuff, not a French cuff or anything fancy. And is a very, very simple basic version of a dress shirt, specifically a tuxedo dress shirt. So this is the one we are going to be dissecting today and it is bright white on our camera so we'll just have to deal with that and figure it out but we'll be counting the pieces counting the number of scenes that we have to that we're dealing with i will count how many um pleats there are how many tucks there are but i don't think i'm gonna those technically count as scenes but i'm gonna call them a decorative detail and not a construct We'll see if we count them as seams. They are stitches that have to get done and we have to account for, but. We have Austin Lips here saying, hi Felicia, how's your day going? It's going great, I finally made it. Sorry I didn't give any warning, but I gave more warning than I technically usually do. So thank you guys who made it. I really appreciate you being here. Um, 45th Clown says, hello, hello 45th Clown. Austin Lips, hey Felicia, hey Austin, and Yanalith, yay, I'm not late. Hi everyone. So welcome Yanalith, welcome everybody that's here. Um, I have lots of scissors over here, but I think I'm going to start with scalpel, please. Um, seam ripper, and um, if I need to, I have a razor blade. And roll call, we have knock, knock top here. Dissection time, yes. Big Bob's props, Heidi ho Heidi ho neighbor. Yes, and Yana says, you're the best. So welcome everybody. Um, 
I'm going to start to the top and go to the bottom. But before we really start pulling this thing apart, let's think about the challenges that this shirt has to, like what problems we are dealing with and the solutions that we came up with. Problem number one, we have to cover a body that has a lot of joints and curves that move and it needs to fit and then also move with those joints, curves and bends. Okay, maybe it's gonna be a little more complicated than we thought, but think about the first problem, your head. Your head is much bigger than your neck and your shoulders are much bigger than your neck. So automatically, the size difference in order to get a garment on, you need to either have it the hole big enough for your head to fit through or you have to have engineer a solution around that. I love knits because it stretches. It just stretches, get it on your head, and then you have a nice crew neck that pulls it right back tight and keeps it up at the top of your neck and um, solves the problem that way. Um, but typically, if we want a really tight neck line, we have to get in it whether we use buttons, zippers, elastic, Velcro, all sorts of things. You need to be able to engineer how you're gonna get your head and then a snug fit. So we have this curve to deal with. And then we have movement all in this area. You have a neck that moves, you have shoulders that move. So you have to make sure that you can move because you can't have it too tight that you cannot breathe. So you automatically just need ease and, you know, breathing room. like. You can't have it at your neck measurement because you will just be way too tight if it is. You need to be able to have some positive ease, positive ease, fancy word for for space to breathe. So that's one thing we need to worry about. Uh, the collar also has a stand, so it stands straight up and then it folds over and it's gonna roll right where the stand seam is. That's where it's going to want to naturally curve and fold. You don't need to necessarily have it as a separate piece. You can just interface right up to that point and then it'll naturally roll over there. You can do a stitch line to encourage it to roll at that place. So it's easier and harder because more seams means more complicated, but easier in control. So simply complicated, but what you need is a stand that then your collar goes up and over. So we need it to stand, we need it to roll, we need it to fit around this curve and we need to breathe a lot of things and we need to move. So those are some of the engineering that we have to think about in how simple and call it complicated just a garment could be. So this garment has buttons to get in and out of it. So that is how they came solve the problem of I need it to fit snugly. And I'm gonna start ripping out the collar because might as well talk while I'm ripping things out. Let me get all the buttons undone because I don't wanna do this later. Hmm. Okay. Oh, it's stitched in so nicely. We have I'm gonna go nice up close. We have top stitching all the way around the collar, around this edge. We have a top stitching all the way around the perimeter of the stand. And we have a buttonhole. So I'm not gonna start at the top stitching. I wanna get this piece deconstructed. And you can see on the outside, there's only one line of stitching that's showing. Can it focus, focus, focus? Oh, I'm sorry, it is not focused, but there's only one line of stitching. On this side, doo -doo -doo, you can see there's two lines of stitching at the bottom. How's that for focusing? I think we're going to have to Oh, and there's a stitch in the ditch. Stitch in the ditch. That means there's an also a stitch right inside where this. Okay, how can I explain stitch in a ditch? 
So you can sew on top of the seam, next to the seam, or try and get in the seam. Stitch in the ditches when you sew right, try and sew right inside the seam. That is what they did right here. So there is one, two, three rows of stitching right here in this little spot. Makes me wonder why they did that. Well, I, I understand why they do it, but it makes more sense once, once you dig in of what they're doing. I found it, okay. Okay, I am going to start at <sighs> trying to figure out which was the last stitch to be done. I don't want to do the stitch in the ditch, but I know I have to do that one. I'm going to go for just the outside top stitching. I'm just going to get this collar detached from this shirt. Ah. So last week we talked about the stitch length and on the tie, most of it was loosely stitched. The stitches were like five stitches per inch top. They were pretty wide stitched, but right at the tip where they really needed it to be a um, nice fold in a crisp corner, they did about 16 stitches per inch. They did a lot of stitches per inch right in that little spot. On this one, on the top stitching, they have it about 10 per stitches per inch. So it's pretty tight. It's not a loose, cheap stitch. Loose, cheap stitch, but... Um, yeah, all of these stitches, three rows of stitches are holding that in right at this collar. This collar is very securely attached. There's a reason they do this this way. It's so that these edges are all finished and tucked in there. <laughs> um, but it's definitely not my favorite seam to rip out, especially when you're finished with the garment. So let me get in there. It's easier to take it apart than it is put together. So there is that. <sighs> I can just rip it. Bruno. Okay. All right, so I just undid the top stitching that was holding a bit of stitching just in this first bit of the collar where it all meets up. So let me get these going. I had a sewing teacher who was like, you know, I find it very relaxing th ripping out other people's work. My own work, not so much, but other people's work, oh, I don't mind at all. I'll just sit there and take out the stitches. It's not a big deal to me. And I'm like, I feel her on that. I really, really do feel her on that. It is very relaxing when you are sitting there ripping out seams, like getting into old costumes, just kind of seeing, deconstructing them, seeing how they were doing. But when it's the seams that I did and I'm like, oh, I know why I'm ripping this out. It's a mistake, but it's better to do it now and do it right. And fix my mistake here. It's still not going to get worse. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <sighs> I am ripping two rows of stitching out at the same time, but it's going pretty fast. I'm not doing it the most cautious of ways, but we're not going to need to preserve this fabric. So at least there's that. Okay. Let me remove this button. I don't wanna lose all my pieces. I'm gonna put my buttons in the spider and I have to keep track of how many seams and how many pieces. So seams and pieces. Okay. I will just run a tally over there where I can see it. All right. 
So I just ripped out one seam. I need to count. Did I rip out only one? Yep, I only ripped out one seam because that's a different seam. All right, I ripped out one seam and now I'm ripping out the other. I ripped the seam out. That was a lot quicker. Okay. It ripped out pretty tight, but right here they did back stitch. So the stitch is locked in very nicely. So it's a little bit more tricky to get out because it's more stitches in there, but not a big deal. Okay, we have a detached collar. And we have a jewel neckline. Jewel neckline, a crew neckline, a fitted neckline. So that's what the neckline looks like without the collar. And then here is the collar. This piece actually has a little bit of curve in it. There is a built-in built curve. This centerpiece, let me measure it. Here we go. I did have measuring tape. Is an inch and a quarter, and it's only an inch and an eighth when you get to the, so it's an inch and a quarter at the center seam. And it's only an inch and an eighth over here. So it's wider here and narrower there. And it has a slight curve to it so that it goes around your neck. But this piece looks like it's pretty darn straight. Nope. I think it might have a little bit of a curve to it too. Which would make it fit much nicer. Now, you could totally use this if you just wanted to call her piece for like a Wednesday Adams costume and you don't want to have to make it from scratch. Right there. There you go. There's your collar. Ta-da! Now you're done. So originally collars used to be a whole separate piece because laundry, laundry was a whole lot harder than it is. I know, I hate laundry. It's a never ending task, but um, practicality of, you know, having to do it and not having modern machinery. People didn't want to wash everything all the time. So let's wash the parts that get gross and stinky the most. Well, what gets gross and stinky the most? Probably your around your neck and your armpits, you know, that kind of stuff. So we had linen undergarments and we had overgarments and we built in layers and they make a lot of sense. The collar is kind of reminiscent of that era. <laughs> the ties used to hold the collar in place, <laughs> but it was a cleanliness thing. All right. I have to count that seam that I just ripped out or I will forget it. So we're to two seams already. I don't have a piece completely off yet, but I can take off the tag and we counted tags on the tie. So I'm going to count the tag on the um, shirt and I'm also going to count the seams that they need to sew to, in order to attach it. So that's two seams right here. Okay. You guys have been talking so well. Yes, Bruno's been barking. Um, okay. Not top. Whole new meaning to pop the collar. Yeah, no, you need to pop the collar on the stand. Uh, but I'm just popping it off. Okay, two seams, one piece. Let's count those. So two more seams, one, two, and one piece. Put that over there with the shirt for now. And let's see if I can flip this inside out. So we have this piece right here. This is the top that goes around the collar. So the collar's like this. This is the top folded over part. I am going to take this part that we just ripped off. This is the seam. It has a um, little opening and I'm gonna turn it inside out. And where it's attached, this center seam. 
I'm going to rip out. Although it has been top stitched before it's been stitched. So I have to rip out that before I do that. And there's also the matter of this little buttonhole. And if you look closely at the buttonhole, it is just straight up stitches. It is just a bunch of stitches. But that's not a big deal. I can rip out the buttonhole. It's not like I haven't done that before. These things aren't as intense as they used to be because it saves a lot of fabric not being so intense. It's just a fancy zigzag. I say that now and now you guys are watching me live and I'll probably screw it up, but whatever. We're just live. We're going to find out what's going on here. Okay. Uh, I think Felicia's done this before. Yes, I've ripped a lot of things apart and put them back together. All sorts of things. And I have had to alter, make, and dissect shirts before. My favorite is to zombify clothing. That's an art in itself. Because you rip it apart in a different way. Ugh. I had to open my mouth and say that it's not that bad. The stitching's not that close together. And now I'm just like really struggling with this buttonhole. But in my defense, buttonholes are supposed to be strong reinforced and not easily taken out because who's gonna rip this apart? Nobody, you're not supposed to. Who would do that? You know what? Shh, don't tell. But I am literally just gonna cut off the buttonhole. Now the buttonhole is gone. I cut off the stitching. We're ripping it apart. We don't need that there. Yeah. All right. And I do have to get that top stitching before I can do the seam that's actually holding them together. And I can't do the rip apart way. Rip apart where you just tear it apart. Because it's top stitching. Okay. Yonalith, at Behind the Scenes Fashions, how is your makeup friend who would love to see her make you up again? Oh, Jody, she's doing great. We were just talking the other day, so she might be coming on soon. Not necessarily for this series, but um, yeah, no, we totally have fun. She has been actually traveling, doing um, beauty pageants lately, so it's been, she's been having some fun adventures. Um, okay, just lift it to the government and you'll be zombified in no time. Well, at least I'll be a fashionable zombie. Ugh, this top stitching is so hard to pull out because it's tiny stitching on multiple layers of fabric. This is funny. I got lipstick on this collar. <laughs> <sighs> These are the teeniest, tiniest stitches. Sometimes because of how long it takes to rip out seams, it is makes way more sense to just cut out a whole new piece than it is to spend the time ripping out the seams. Sometimes it doesn't make financial sense, but oh, just how tricky it can be. It sometimes just makes complete sense. <sighs> More I pull this, the tighter it's getting. Okay, good. Oh, I got that piece off. Could you tell I was really struggling? All right. <sighs> I'm ripping out these teeny, teeny, tiny top stitches. I'm not counting the buttonholes as a seam because they are just a... They are a decorative detail, but you count those when you're counting like the accessories. 
in a garment. It's a whole different machine. Okay, you know what? I got enough of that top stitching that I can turn it inside out and start ripping the top stitching out as I rip out that actual seam. Oh, that's so much faster. This stuff takes forever. Okay, we're getting there. It's a part. Whew. Rip through the top stitching layer and the actual stitching layer. So that is two seams that I just ripped out. One, two, we are up to six seams. And we have, this is a, a piece, a complete piece. This is the interior exterior stand. And then we have, okay, so this is the stand. These are two pieces to the stand. And there is still a piece stitched to this piece, but this piece is all by itself. I know when you make a collar, when you have these multiple layers, you can see that the seam allowance on this one's much narrower than this one because you grade the seam allowance so that it doesn't get too bulky. But this piece right here has a stiffer interlining layer. We're gonna rip out in just a minute. We're gonna get to that. But this is the um, finished seam. So it would be sewn together like this and then flipped inside out. So we have one piece, let me get the inter, interfacing. Yeah, the interfacing out of this piece. It looks like it is a woven. Is it a um, sew-in or a, um, what do they call it when it's like heat pressed with the glue dots? Glued in, I guess, technically, because the, um, iron in, iron in interfacing. I usually avoid that stuff like the plague for actual garment construction. I love that stuff for crafting and arts and I made a paper corset using that um, fusible, fusible um, interfacing, like the heavy duty, like I ironed the paper to make it into a fabric. But for actual garment construction, I don't typically like using the non-woven iron and stuff, I prefer just either using self-fabric or a woven sew-in because it feels fancier and it's way easier to work with. And then you don't get a um, big bulky melted piece into your garment. I've never liked that. That makes something look instantly homemade in my opinion. And I have lots of those. Okay. Okay, yes, I did just rip those. But ripping fabric and ripping seams, you just kind of got to go for it because otherwise, you see this, how long this is pick, taking me to just get this top stitching off? I'm trying to get this layer here so I can get this piece of interfacing out. And I haven't gotten a good thing to pull yet. <sighs> otherwise, it gets really tedious and takes forever. That's okay. You guys are here keeping me company, so we'll we'll, we'll get through it. Okay, H70 Polo. Hey, Felicia, I'm eating dinner. See Odin recently? No, I have not seen him since the last live stream a couple weeks ago. I didn't go to the live stream this Sunday because I was doing stuff, but I will be there next Sunday. And we're actually gonna make some progress, which is exciting. I am ready to get those packs done and they are getting closer and closer to that finishing spot. Okay. Yes, I finally have a big enough of a tail that I can, nope, can't rip it yet. Still working on it. Ugh. Maybe. See how patient I am? I'm just. <laughs> These are nice tight stitches. It means it's very well made. 
which means it's actually harder to rip apart. Yeah. In shirt construction, with the weight of the fabric and the um, movement and wear and tear that the stitches have to resist, ultimately, you want the thread to be weaker than your fabric for the one reason of it is way easier to fix a split seam than it is to fix a torn shred piece, shredded piece of fabric. So as a, like it does, there's a benefit, like having a really strong thread holding something together is really good up until a point where the, the fabric, if it's not as strong as the thread, the thread's gonna hold and the fabric's gonna tear. You don't want the fabric to tear, you want the thread to tear. Um, because shredded fabric is very hard to fix. There's ways to darn it and stuff, but it's not gonna look as good. It never does. Well, sometimes it does, but you know what I mean? But a pop seam is super easy to fix. But on a shirt, you want a good strong seam that's not gonna necessarily pop. But there are limits because ultimately, if you're putting that kind of stress on it, you want it to pop at the seam and not at the Thread. Okay, I said that enough times. <laughs> okay. Okay. Iana, if you need help, I wish somebody would make Thanksgiving movie. I would watch that. I feel like there's lots of Thanksgiving movies, but then they all turn into Christmas movies towards the end. It's the whole holiday season, I think. But, yep, right now my house is all neutral and nice before, like, while well, between the crazy, scary Halloween decorations that just got taken down. I need to remember what the house looks like, and now I'm going to get ready to put up all the Christmas decorations. That's going to be super fun. Yeah, they're all piled over there. <laughs> Waiting to be worked on. Oh, geez, this is just taking forever, but it's okay. I'm almost there. Look it. I got it. Okay. And it looks like this was a, let me see if I can peel it off. Looks like this interfacing was completely... Yep, it is fused to that. That is a good fusible woven. Okay. I guess technically I didn't just have to rip out that seam that I ripped out because this thing is not coming apart. So inside of this piece, there is a woven interlining layer that is ironed in. And that gives more structure and support so that this part of the collar can stand up tall. So that is two more pieces and one more seam. Two more pieces, one more seam. Okay. There's three collar pieces plus the tag and now this is the What is this piece called? You know, I have the answers to that question right here. I believe it's right here. I think that's just called the collar part and this part is the stand. Yeah, because it's collar edge and neckline. Ugh. That is the instructions if I wanted to pattern this from scratch, which if you ever need a pattern making book, Pattern Design for Fashion Design. Great book. This is only the fourth edition, and they've come out with many, many editions since then, but I know that that one has the numbers that work out because I think a couple editions after the numbers were funny. But anyways, okay. I am removing the top stitching. 
so that I can then turn this inside out. And it is also I kind of like that I took out two seams at the same time, but the, make it around this corner without like ripping it. There we go. Okay. You know, there's not really there are tons of Christmas movies, but no Thanksgiving movies. I think they have like a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. I don't know. Um, behind the scenes fashions. How much does that cost? I have no idea what that book is going for these days. When I had to buy it, it was when I was in school and I had to pay full price for it. And it was because we needed the that edition, the newest edition. Don't look at how old that book is, please. But um, yeah, it was a college textbook, so it wasn't cheap when I got it. But now I think it's cheap, especially if you get the older editions. OK, yes, this also has that um, woven in interfacing. So I'm going to add two more seams because there was the seam that held it all together and then it was top stitched and I ripped them out at the same time instead of one at a time. So two more seams and now we have three more pieces. One, two, three. Because although there are two pieces in my hand, there is this piece inside of here that is a woven interfacing. And it is melted in, glued in. There is no way to separate this without just shredding this fabric. It would be nice if I could. But it is really pressed in there. What they do is they put like a layer of glue dots in between the, the two fabrics and they just melt them together, which is the best. It really works great. But um, it's permanent. So... Those are the collar pieces for, so just in the collar, we are at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces. Why does it say I, oh yeah, and nine seams. Six, seven, <laughs> can't forget that. All right. So that was just the neckline, the neckline collar, seven pieces for this. Now we are going to go into the sleeve. And yeah, let's just detach the sleeves, both of them, right at the shoulder seam. I think that's the next step. Yeah, let's. Ianalis says, yeah, I think you're right. I miss watching peanut movies. The peanut movie is about when they got all the Snoopy's reunion. I think there's also like a Garfield version of like the Thanksgiving movies, but good old cartoons, right? Okay, so let's look at these seams. So all of these edges were done with a straight stitch. This was all done on an industrial sewing machine. Industrial sewing machine means it does one stitch and it does it really fast. And it, yes, it, it does a straight stitch and it goes as fast as you can. The thing you can change about it is the stitch length. You cannot change it into zigzags. You cannot do fancy stitches. It is just straight. This whole collar was put together using a straight stitch machine. Now we have this inside out. And look at these lovely seams. That is a serger seam right there. It is a serged and stitched seam. See how there is a looped stitch on the back and then the serged edge? So how many of you guys have ever tried to rip out a serged seam? And how many times has it turned into knots and you wanted to cry and just scream and it's easier to cut it off? It is easier to cut it off, but I'm not going to. But um, there is a secret on how you rip apart serger seams. It takes a minute. 
but I'm just going to start at this armpit because it's a jumbled mess of craziness. When you are trying to rip apart a serger seam, you are ignoring the loops on the edge. The loopers, you pull those, it's going to pull into a tight knot that you're not going to be getting out. But then there's the row of the straight stitchings, both right after the loops and the right after the stitches. Those are what you want to rip out. Although this is a chain stitch, so if I get the right spot, I can just pull a thread and it will all just come undone. But I have to do it in the right direction and I don't think this is the right direction. <laughs> seems, seems, seamy. Yeah, seems, seems, seamy. Um, yeah, that is the wrong direction for that. Let me. All right, it's mostly just getting it going. And then once you get it going, you just rip it apart. Okay. All right, so I got all this crazy fuzz of thread from ripping out these serge seams. I can't pull this thread to rip out my seams because it will just tie it into a tighter knot. What I'm doing is on this side of the fabric, if you look at the serge seams right here, I'm taking my, ah, it is so out of focus. Let me put it where it needs to be and I'll show you where I'm cutting. So see how I am through both loops of my surged edge of the stitching line? It's not focused and it must be really hard to see, but I'm cutting these two threads every quarter of an inch and then kind of picking out the stitching in between that. It's a little bit tedious, but we'll get through it. Yeah, you don't have to do every single stitch. You just kind of do every chunk of stitches, but you want to give yourself small enough chunks that you don't cause knots in between where you're actually ripping out. Hmm. Okay. Ah, I caught the wrong spot. Oh, well, it's not the end of the world. Aha. You get it started and then you just rip it. All right, so I just took out one seam. I'm going to mark that before I forget it. Okay, I have to rip out the other side arm before I move on, but let's kind of look at the shape here. That's very interesting. Okay, so the front curve and the back curve are the same. So when I pattern draft my sleeve patterns, I know that you can have a, um, a steeper curve in the front and a slightly shallower curve in the back. Why do we do this? Because the way our arms bend and move, we need a little bit more of a tighter fit in the front to, to um, help with the way our arms bend in this socket. And we need a little bit longer and shallower of a curve in the back, but it's just like such a marginal difference. It's like a quarter of an inch. Like, you take it off from one side and you add it to the other side. So that's why when you see a um, 
sleep pattern. They're not necessarily even. But at the same time, there's certain fits that it doesn't make a big difference on. And stretchy knits, I don't even bother with it. Like there's times when I do, like if it's like the fit needs to be impeccable, I'll go for that extra little. But um, in general, I sometimes skip that part depending on how, because I tend to do a really tight arms hole anyways. But I just think it's very interesting that this commercially made little teeny tiny tuxedo shirt doesn't bother to have a difference between the front and the back of the sleeve pattern, which actually makes life easier. But so for better or for worse, I like that it's an even sleeve pattern. And then you can work with only half a pattern. No, because of this. Oh, Dan does junk is here. Welcome, Dan. So being a master seamstress, which kind of stitch do they use for bags of rice? And what's the trick on opening them up from just pulling the thread? I tend to fail doing so. Okay, so that is a very good question. That is a running stitch. In this sleeve, there was a running stitch. The, the edge was a surged edge, but just a little bit in from that was a running stitch edge. So it is where you, I have no thread. I need a giant whiteboard. Maybe I'll work on getting one of those so I could draw out the picture for you. But yeah, I'll get, a, I'll work on getting a whiteboard. But a running stitch, it is you stick a loop of fabric up through the, a loop of thread up through the fabric and to keep the loop from pulling back out of the fabric, they run a, another piece of thread just straight inside of there like it's a peg and loop and it gets locked in place. And so there's a running stitch and it ends up with a bunch of loops on the back. That's how original sewing machines, hi Toby. That's how original sewing machines were designed. They do that running stitch. So rice bags, dog food bags, they have that running stitch. Those handheld sewing machines, they do a running stitch. The ones that you can manually do or they even have motorized versions, that's a running stitch. And I don't know how much experience people have with crochet, but you get all the loops on. There's one way you pull it and the loops just and all come undone. And then there's the other side you pull it from and it just gets tight every time you pull it. There is a way to look at it and know which way it's going to be. Usually just kind of got to loosen the ends. Like when I'm ripping these seams apart, I kind of get the edges started by figure out which way we're going. And then you kind of go from there. And sometimes it's trial and error. And sometimes you can see it really super, super easily. But I don't know a trick off the top of my head to tell you the easier way to do it. But yes. H70 Polo, is this making you a better fashion designer? Learning how the pros do it, eh? Reverse tailoring, 100%. Um, costume shop, ripped apart things all the time. When knockoffs, you don't necessarily have to rip it into pieces. You can do this without physically taking the garment apart. You ask questions and you got to figure it out. But yes, honestly, yes. Ripping things apart, seeing how they put together makes a huge difference. When I was making wedding dresses, we had sample dresses. When we had questions as to, wait, how does this sleeve? It's kind of weird. You go and grab the sample dress, pull it out, look at the seams, rip, not rip it apart, but you have to evaluate how was this accomplished? Because obviously we made it. And then um, kind of making sure that everything matches from there. So sample garments are made for a reason so that you can reference and then also ripping things apart helps you figure out how things were constructed. You don't have to rip something apart in order to steal a pattern from it. But it does make it easy if you're not very good at pattern drafting. Look at all this thread. It's just... Who needs spider web Halloween decorations when I can just rip out seams? All right, let me rip out this other seam instead of talking so much. Or I can talk while I rip the seam out. Okay. Reverse tailoring. Yes. 
When I was little, my dad had me rip apart a cat, a carburetor for a car because my dad's a mechanic. And I thought it was super fun. And then after it was all in pieces, he's like, do you remember how to put it back together again? I was like, no. He's like, that's the part. That's the important part. You have to like understand why it's a, what the pieces are doing and that it needs to go back together again. And I know this isn't a carburetor, but it's the same concept. <laughs> You just kind of sometimes just got to rip things apart and figure out how they work. Reverse engineering. All right. Let me get this scene going. So I'm when I'm ripping out a scene, especially for the sleeve scene, there is a side seam that intersects with this seam. And there's also a shoulder seam. I typically like to start at the underarm seam because it's usually uglier and if I make a hole or mistake, it's easier to hide in the armpit than the shoulder. So where all those seams are interacting, it's a big knot of places. So it's a place, good spot to just start ripping. So I typically start ripping sleeves off at the armpit. <clears throat> Information, sometimes you might need to know this, especially if you're like making a sleeveless jacket, ripping off the sleeves so you can have a vest. I don't know, but I have apparently needed to rip sleeves off things enough to know this, but I also did make dresses, wedding dresses. And okay. Dan does junks. Thanks. I got to look into that stitch more. It's not necessarily a stitch. It's more, um, if you want to use it, just get a handheld sewing machine. Like they don't even need to be battery operated. You can have a handheld sewing machine that you can just pinch and it'll stitch and it'll do that running stitch. So if you wanted to use it for like sealing up rice bags, it's a handheld sewing machine. Um, I don't have any that I recommend because the only ones I've ever used were weird vintage ones and I thought they were cool nifty novelty items, but I never did any serious, serious sewing with them. But yeah. <laughs> and this is how Felicia unmakes. Yes. Destruction this week. Well, destruction time and we will learn and then. We'll do something with it. We'll figure it out. All right. Armpits open. The hard part's over. Let's see. Just get it started and then it gets easier. So sometimes before I do a big like tear like you guys see, I'll pre-rip some stitches coming up so that I don't get necessary. Keeps me from getting knots. Okay, so when you pull on things, sometimes it really tightens the stitches. Instead of ripping them out, it just pulls them into a tighter and tighter knot. And if you have some stitches ripped behind it, it's not continuing the line and making it tighter and tighter the whole seam down. It will just get tight to that one section and then you don't have to deal with it. If you cut every so often, it keeps it from really getting into a bind. And that is from pure experience. I have ripped out lots and lots of seams. And I'm realizing how many seams I've ripped out now that <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. It makes a big difference. But I don't want to rip that. I'm going to tear the fabric if I do. Okay, another sleeve off. Let me mark another seam I just ripped out. Okay, so we have two sleeves off. I tore it a little bit right here. But you know what? Maybe it is slightly different. Let me lay this flat. Nope, it is slightly different. I, I, 
I rescind what I said earlier. Okay, when I said the front and the back were the same, it is not. It is that quarter inch difference. If you put it right on that fold, it is a quarter inch longer in the back and shorter in the front. I was gonna say, it's a woven shirt. They usually go through the effort on woven shirts. Why do they go through the effort on woven shirts? Well, because woven is a very strict grid system and there is very limited motion and you want to get as tight of a fit as you can in the sleeve for the most motion you can have. So this is the formula for your armhole depth. Bust divided by six plus one. If you wanna see how deep to make your armhole, you take your bust measurement divided by six and add an inch. So that inch is like movement and ease room for um, woven fabrics. It's not necessarily for a sleeveless garment or a, um, or a fitted knit. So that's that pattern, that formula. It's a, it's a guideline. It's not a rule, but it's a place to start. And um, a lot of men's dress wear, they do really big, deep armholes, like significantly bigger than they need to be. Because usually they're like nine, 10 inches is way bigger, big enough for like a size large armhole, but typically it can get up to like 14 inches because suiting in order to fit a multitude of sizing and shapes, they tend to do a bigger armhole, but it limits your um, motion because look at it. If my shirt is tucked in, it's gonna pull up. And the higher up the armhole is, the more range of motion I have. Now a lower armhole, Let's put it back down where it belongs, is going to limit my range of motion. People don't typically think about this because we haven't had to deal with this problem very often. I haven't dealt with this problem very often, but I did wear this gorgeous vintage dress one day and I had help putting it on when I left the house, but when I got home, nobody was home. Like I didn't have anybody home that I could help reach my, and it was a gorgeous vintage dress and I didn't want to rip it, but I was starting to feel claustrophobic because there was no way I could physically reach my zipper. So I ended up calling my BFF Brienne. I love you if you ever listen to this <laughs> and driving over to her house just so she could help me out of my dress because I was stuck. We don't often work, deal with that because we have st modern stretch fabrics that help eliminate that issue as much. We also have the movement and easement built into our shirt. So there is, this is not a skin tight sleeve and it's not skin tight on my um, chest. And if I wanted it to be more tight and fitted, I could raise the arm hole to get more range of motion, but then it starts to get bulky in your armpits and nobody likes bulky armpits. I don't know, you might be into it, but it's not my thing. But um, so technicalities and trickinesses of sleeves. So simply complicated, it's easier to have a, uh, So this is the, doo -doo -doo, let me see the sleeve. This is this sleeve. This is the front. This is the back. Okay, so the front has more fabric on it than the back. That's almost actually a full half inch. But see right here, they're lined up flat. This fabric is about a half an inch longer than this piece of fabric. And that's sewn at the seam line right there. So that is going to mean it's a tighter fit here, but it gives you more space here because you're more likely to have your shoulders forward than trying to figure out how to push them back. Oh, but um, yeah, it's things you have to think about when patterning a shirt. So, and then here is the armhole and you can see that this armhole isn't completely straight and flat. It goes in ever so slightly here, but the armhole's the same here and it's the same here, but right here is where you have the difference. 
And that's right where this sleeve is. Okay, another thing about sleeves, this measurement, the circumference of your sleeve hole and the circumference of your sleeve hole that attaches to your sleeve to your shirt, this is usually about an inch to two inches bigger than your sleeve hole because of easing. What is easement? Again, it's kind of just you smoosh it. But um, if you look at this sleeve, there's not really a gather to it, but it fits my um, shoulder. So what easing does, it takes this fabric and you just kind of go like this. So you take your flat pattern and you just kind of gather the pieces so then it fits into your sleeve to cap your sleeve again. That's gonna help with the fit and the comfort of wearing a general long sleeve woven shirt. Okay. Austin left my uncle takes engines apart and then puts them back together again. So is my dad, he does that for his living. Dan does junk, so satisfying to watch and hear all the ripping. Yes, I do like doing the ripping. Um, Does that work for foam as well? The stitching? Yeah, you can stab it. You can sew through foam. Depends on how thick your foam is, but yeah, you can totally stitch. Is that what you were questioning? Anyways, okay. So now I have a sleeve. I'm not gonna rip apart both sleeves because that's just gonna take way too long and it's in doubles. So I will count whatever the sleeve is and then double it not that lazy. It's only kind of lazy. All right. Where am I going to start? I think I'm going to start with ripping off the button and cutting out the buttonhole because I don't want to rip out all those teeny tiny stitches. That just seems... not super beneficiary. I miss just the tiniest little bit of stitching. One second. I like this scissors because it looks like the bite bird is biting my um, work and it makes me laugh and smile. So thank you, Ginger, for coming up with such a wonderful design that is novel and still around. Okay, so button removed, buttonhole removed. I am going to... Do there is two rows of top stitching on the outside and only one row of stitching on the inside. So I'm just going to get into those both rows and see if I can rip them out together. But I'm ripping out two rows of stitching for our stitch and seam count. I get past this placard. There we go. Okay, so that was one, two rows of stitching. I just ripped. Key, sorry about your microphones or earphones. Two rows of stitching. All right. Going to turn it inside out, and we, it looks like we have one, two more seams. Nope, three more seams. Three more seams because there is a seam here and a seam here, but there is not a seam here, and there is a top stitching seam right here that I did not. Actually, I thought I was ripping out, but I didn't rip out. I just ripped out the other stitching line. So let me. Hi, Toby. Okay. 
Okay. Looks like they folded this and stitched it. There we go, got it all done. Let me get this other side. Oh, Toby, you wanna come say hi? Toby, come here. Toby, come here, high five. Toby, come here, high five. Let me see if I can show you guys. Toby, Toby, come here. Here's his ear. Here's the Toby. Say hi. Hi, Toby. Okay. Yes, there's Toby. Oh. <laughs> he is right at my feet. He is literally on my foot. Oh. <laughs> He's on your guys' feet too now. Okay. Sorry, Toby. <laughs> okay, let me get this other stitch out. And then we can count this and double it. <sighs> yeah, I don't want to rip this out twice. <laughs> So this is one piece plus an inner interfacing layer. And I did the three seams, so. Two pieces, now I have to double it. Okay, those pieces can go in the pile with that sleeve. Now let me take care of this placard. This placard right here, it's this thing. So mine is fancy and has an extra buttonhole. I'm glad this one's not fancy and does not have an extra buttonhole. Okay. Okay, let me get this top stitching row. I keep saying top stitching. What is top stitching? Top stitching is the decorative stitching that you see on top of the fabric and not necessarily the construction stitching that holds things together. Yes, it does hold things together. Yes, it holds things in place, but you can see it and it's on top. And it's so much harder to rip out because you can't just pull the two pieces apart as easily. But there we go. Okay. So one row of top stitch. That's one seam for top stitching because that was a whole seam of itself. Or, and let's do this row of stitching. That's all one seam. Okay, so right here, this is really interesting the way they did it. So I'm ripping it out, the top stitching right now, and I ripped it off to this point, and you go to this point, and you can see, I don't know if you guys can see, but this little tiny piece of where they cut so that this would fold over nicely. So... <sighs> things that you're going to need to do if you were to make this. And rip this seam out. Okay, so this is a, and it is just a little rectangle. For being a little pointy piece, it is not sewn a pointy piece. Well, it's sewn into a pointy piece, but it's not a pattern of a pointy piece. It is just a straight up rectangle that has been folded into a pointy piece. Good thing this is the last bright white item because this is really hard on the camera. Um, 
So this is another piece and another seam. Go in the pile of pieces. Okay. Sorry, Toby. It's okay, babies. Scared them a little bit there. Okay, so now I still have this other side of the placard that I need to rip off. And it is top stitched on. It's like a bias binding, but it's not on the bias, it's just on the straighter grain. But it is a bound edge. Toby has now moved. Okay. And this is just a little rectangle. It's folded in and then folded in and folded in half. So that is another piece and another seam. And one. I just realized I have to double it because we're doing it for both sleeves. Okay. Have to keep it. Thing. All right. So now. So this was all a serger seam. This was all a. Um, straight stitch machine. So it's interesting when you're kind of thinking about how this garment needs to be constructed because when you're using different machines, it needs to either A, go to a different person or you have to get up and go to a different section to handle it. That the collar can all be, the collar, the cuff can be done in all in a straight stitch machine, but the sleeve itself is done with a, um, so right here, I found something very interesting. Notice how this kind of just pinches together right there. That is right here. I have two pleats right here. This has one big pleat. That is also because we have arms that bend and bend and our wrist is significantly smaller than our forearm, which is not always, but often smaller than your upper arm. As somebody who's patterned hundreds of sleeve patterns, there are people who have larger forearms than upper arms. Typically, the upper arm is larger than the forearm, and then the wrist is the tiniest. And then also right at the forearm, you have to consider bend. So when you bend a joint, that also is going to need space to move, comfortable space to move. That's why the sleeve is nice and loose, because it gives me literally just enough space to comfortably bend my elbow. So when you're looking at patterns for sleeves, if you are doing a typical fitted sleeve pattern, going to the back of the book for the um, sloper patterns, sloper patterns. A sleeve right here, elbow dart, so that you can bend your elbow and have that automatic bend built in as tight as you can keep it. So instead of doing a tight fitted sleeve, they just give the natural fitted easing, but instead of having the dart here, they take the dart and bring it into the cuff. So it just kind of gathers into the cuff. And instead of doing even gathers, they do a clean pleat because it does a much better job. Uh, okay, so we have that pleat, interesting things. One last seam and then we are done with the sleeve. Will we finally have this thing apart? Probably not, but I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. Let's get it started. All right. Oh, that's our just thread. And here is our sleeve pattern. 
This is the cap. This is the underarm seam. This is the wrist. And instead of having the start at the elbow, it is at the wrist. So one thing that I find really interesting about sleeves is this curve right here matches this curve. They look like the opposite curves, but they're the exact same curve and they line up perfectly. And it's not until you get up towards the cap of the sleeve that you have that easing that they no longer line up. And then you need to gather your sleeve into your armhole. But right at the bottom of the armhole and both little sides of our pattern, that is the same curve as your pattern piece right here and right here. So sometimes like when I'm patterning, I will trace one to the other so that I know that they line up perfectly. So things to keep in mind when you are patterning these. Okay. Okay. Um, they have goats grazing by a creek and I brought Miko to show her since she likes looking at other animals. Aww. Um, Yonalith, what are you writing on the table? I'm, it's a glass table, so I just have a dry erase marker and I just write directly on the table. And then when I'm done, I wipe it off. I like working on glass tables. I know it's controversial, but it's my preference. Uh, Dan does junk. I should teach you OBS. There's more involved with it, but you can fine tune your settings, picture, audio, etc., images, and background music. I'm just going to keep being better each time working on it, but I think OBS is a good place to go. Um, you want to lift? Yeah, it would be nice to have a dog cam. I know Toby would like that. He definitely likes to be near me when I'm crafting. James Spoke. Hello, James Spokes. Hey, Felicia, how'd the Halloween costume turn out? It turned out amazing, fit perfectly. And the um, stretch that I was worried about, we solved all those issues. So it was a comfortable fit, no writing, no um, nothing like that. And it was a comfortable costume to be in on all night. So I think it was success, a success. Ultimately, I need to redo the pom-poms. Because I, the pom-poms on the hat, the cat toys work perfectly, but they need to get turned white. And then I need to do bigger pom-poms on um, the collar. But I really like the way that the collar turned out. It looks like the pictures to me. So I should put that pattern available for others to use. But eventually, working on it. <clears throat> okay, so we have the sleeve apart. Let's count that underarm seam and we double it because we did it for both of them. And now we have two pieces that we are now adding to our pile of pieces. Okay, and then we are to back to the shirt. The main body of the shirt. We have a front piece, we have a back piece, the front and the back are basically the same shape on the shoulders, except for instead of being right at the top of the shoulders, it's ever so slightly forward. And it's for a reason. Specifically, um, it's a fitting. I, honestly, I just forgot right now, especially since I'm in the on the spot, like live on the internet as to why that happens. I forgot what it was, but I remember there's a reason. It's also a reason that we have a yoke. So this shirt, as fancy as it is with all of this pleating, does not have a yoke. But the shirt that I'm currently wearing does have a yoke. And look at that pleat. And it stretches and expands when my shoulders go forward. That's its job. It's reinforced this fabric right here. There's two layers of fabric here. Um, think about Western shirts, cowboy shirts. Think about cowboys on horses and having to do farm work and they need their shirts to be tough and not wear out. They reinforce the shoulders for that reason so that they have a strong shirt that's going to be reinforced and not wear out. But at the same time, there's that pleat on the back. So there's the flexibility of being able to move your sleeves and not being stuck. So... 
This shirt does not have a yoke. It is just a flat back. I, however, have shirts right here. This one has a yoke. Oh, it's way too high. This is the exact same shirt I'm wearing, except for in red. But this one has this pleat right here and up into this yoke. And often it's a pretty fabric on the inside. So you can see that it is. I'm gonna button this. Okay. Okay, so see right on the inside, this is the yoke. This shirt does not, the shirt we're dissecting does not have a yoke, but this is an important functional piece of garment of the garment that we don't often talk about. And see that pleat right here in the center? This is the inside of the pleat. Sometimes they put the pleat on the outside that way and sometimes they pleat it this way. But what it is, it's movement. And this shirt right here that I have has the yoke, but there's no pleat right there. It's just smooth across the back. But this has a over deep armhole to make up for that movement, which right here I think is where the a tight fitting armhole probably would have stopped for this size of shirt. But this one doesn't have a black back pleat, but it does have a yoke. Let me get this back out of my way, but, oh, another thing I wanted to talk about, because this is the next piece I'm going to rip off, is this button placard. So let me rip off these buttons. So, did you know that men's shirts and women's shirts button up on different sides? They try and say it's because of like when people used to get dressed by others versus when they dress themselves or having a um, lady in waiting or having a groomsman or assistant as to whether you dressed yourself or had others dress you. And there may or may not be truth in that. I think we just kind of picked a standard and we stuck with it. But what I find really interesting is that in men's fashion, it matters a lot. In women's fashion, it's not as big of a strict of a rule. Like working at the costume shop, um, I would see like it's probably like the first time a man's probably interacted with a woman's shirt just like in the 70s section in like the costuming section. You know, you just grab a colorful blouse and oh this is going to look crazy and great for this costume and then you have a guy they go into the dressing room and they can't figure out why they can't button up their shirt they're like just struggling and it's just like not clicking I've seen it happen so many times it's funny because like you go to do it and it's not working it's like you're you were handed a pencil in your left hand like I know how to write what letters but not this way if that makes sense so in men's wear it definitely needs to be on the correct side. And in women's wear, you can go both ways. I've seen it both ways. But a good way to remember which side you need to put your button placard on. I had a teacher tell me this story and it makes sense. So I'm going to share it with you. Take for what you want. But if... Um, so this is a men's shirt. This is a woman's shirt. Let me just pull these over here. So if a guy and a girl are sitting in a car, and this is in America because I know that in not every country sits in the same sides of the car, but if a guy and a girl are in an American car and the guy is driving and the girl is in the passenger seat, they should be able to reach over and reach inside of the blouse. So the guy can reach over and get in and the girl could reach over and get in. So if he's at the car, the driver's seat, she can reach in and then he can reach in. I know it's so weird, but that's like, you're never going to. Okay. Oh, that's cool. 
I like the way they did that. Sorry, what are they? What am I talking about? Let me get this open. What I thought was happening isn't what's happening. What? <sighs> Let me rip off these, cut out these buttonholes. It is not worth it to rip them out nicely. One. A two. I'll use the big scissors, it works better. Three. Oh, missed a spot. Four. Okay. Ripped those off. Okay, sorry, I know it's getting quiet back because often I am worried about how this is going to go back together. And really ought to handle with a whole lot more care than I typically do. Ah. Good night, Wolverine Scratch. I'm probably going to stop pretty soon myself because I'm running out of time. But thank you for joining me. I appreciate that you guys came here to my live stream. Okay, what is this? Oh, dang. I like the way they did that. Okay, what did they do? Well, how they finished the bottom edge of this is they folded it up and folded it up. And then they, at the ends, they folded it in and folded it up. It's a lot of pressing, but they just, and then, <sighs> I know I need a closer up camera so you guys can see what I'm talking about, but it is a, I see where they're trying to save time and also where it takes a little more effort, but I appreciate it. Okay. So this piece, you love these like crazy buttonholes that I cut out was one piece that was extended and folded in on itself. When I pattern a um, a placard, a button placard on a sleeve, I often just fold the whole thing over one inch plus seam allowance. And is this one inch plus seam allowance? It might be slightly smaller scale. Yep, one inch plus seam allowance. And then that way it fits this curve and it finishes it finishes the seam with one pattern piece instead of two. So let's add a seam, but not another piece. Okay. Oh my goodness. It's not the worst, but just look at how many stitches there are. Good, really right up close here. But look at how many rows of stitching. There is four. Oh, this thing does not want to focus right here. Oh. But there are one, two, three, four rows of stitching plus the loop surged edge. So it's okay, I'll rip it out. I usually just go along all of the stitching lines. Just try and get them started. Oh, and there's a top stitching line. <laughs> this is secure as secure as secure. 
It's because they didn't do the yoke. And it's a kid's shirt, and it probably needs to be reinforced that many times, if we're being honest. Okay, this is one seam, but it's like lots of rows of stitching, but I'm only going to count it as one seam. One seam with lots and lots of rows of stitching. It's not just, a, it's not super easy to just rip out. Neonolith says, it's okay, I'm making Lego Christmas baubles. I was thinking it might be fun to make a Lego Christmas tree, like a little Lego tree with um, mini fig ornaments. Because I've been in Christmas mindset lately. Working on Christmas decorations, not fully there yet, but it's almost time to start putting them up. <laughs> Dan does junk. I can imagine there's an R&D having a kid run around in their shirt to determine how many stitches it takes to finally hold. Well, the thing is, kind of, but not, because it is a not heavily used garment. This is a special event garment. So it's not expected to be worn on a daily. So you can get away with. Um, whoops. Shh. We are only live. Okay, that's just potential spam. At least I don't have to like feel guilty that I'm not answering. <laughs> but um, But I think people like just in general, we've decided like how, how tight we really need things to be. But yeah, consumer reports. Okay, so we got that shoulder seam out. I'm only counting it as one seam. Plus the other side, because I'm not ripping out the other side. There's no point. It's symmetrical from here. So that is the shoulder seam. And you can notice that there's a shoulder slope here and a slope here. So this is supposed to fit the curve of your neck and the slope of your shoulder. A good kind of way to figure out your curve of your neck is typically on, this is this shoulder seam is forward. But on a t-shirt, your shoulder seems usually right at the top and your sleeve you want right there. But you measure from your shoulder seam and you go down until where your neck is. And then that would be, I'm between three and a half and four inches on my neckline in general. But um, that's how you determine how deep of a neckle. But then the shoulder slope, the difference between here and here. It's usually about a half an inch. You start with a half an inch, you can go up and down once you get into fittings. That's where a sloper helps because you can figure out all these little nuances, things specifically to your body. And then you don't have to rethink it again. You just have to literally trace your shoulder seam armhole. Sometimes I use my slopers literally just for that. I, I draw in my neckline for reference get my shoulder slope and armhole, and then I pattern everything else from there, you know, like, but it's just like, I don't want to remath that. So. <sighs> Makes a difference on fit. It always does. Okay. Ionalis says, I can see you in the link to the official Lego Christmas tree set. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, it's not a full-size Christmas tree. <laughs> Time to make some Odin scale Lego parts. Um, I don't know. I was thinking it might be fun to make a little mini tree just decorated in um, like Lego bits and pieces, like making all the stuff. But there's already a kit. 
I know there's the fun of putting a kit together, but also there's the fun in designing your own stuff. And in my head, that was one of my own creations, but it's kind of exciting to know that there's a Lego tree kit. Okay. I really like the way they finished this edge. They just rolled it up a couple times and made it happen. And it is a clean edge finish. They don't typically do this because there's often a curve at the hem of a shirt. Why is there a curve at the hem of the shirt? Polo players, so they could ride their horses and keep their shirts tucked in. But it caught on because when you sit down and you lean forward and you move around, you kind of want your shirt to stay tucked in. So when they have that extra little curve, it fits your body, but it's not necessary. It's like, what can we get away with? What do we not be able to get away with? It's like uh, military, like military grade, the most efficient, cheapest way to make it accomplish its task. Nothing extra, not any tougher than it needs to be. Just tough enough. But I think that's also where you get into quality. Like you can look at these things, like see how tight the stitching is. If you see it as a, real, a good tight stitching, it's a better quality garment. If you see that they're really big, looser stitches, it's probably going to fall apart and not be as nice of a garment. You also, it's harder to shop online and look at these things. But that's when you go into the close-up photos. Okay. So that is another seam. So center back, that is a piece. I'm not ripping off this side because it's symmetrical. So I'm going to count that as a pattern piece. And it's only one. It's pattern piece is probably cut on the fold, except for this is a commercially created pattern. So they don't cut those on the fold. But it's a symmetrical pattern piece. This is our front pattern piece. And this is sewn the same way that the other side was. So it's another stitching seam. Oh, I'm just gonna do this side. And rip off this piece. So that is two more. I could have had this all off on one side and I didn't even think that how far ahead. Iana, like Felicia and Dan, I would recommend buying bricks and plates at lego.com because it's not as expensive as blank neck and way better variety of pieces to look at. I love that, but I am not kind of there. I buy Lego at thrift stores, garage sales. And when I find them for cheap, like when I can get like a whole bin for a dollar and such. Like I look for those deals. And then you kind of get what you get, but that's the fun of Lego. Unless there's a specific set. And I really, really like their florals. I haven't purchased one yet, but I am obsessed with their plants and florals. Okay. Um... I think I skipped a comment, not on purple. Oh, wait, no, it's right there. Um, Dan does junk. Certain clothing items I can't shop online for because I need to actually see it and see if it fits and feels right. A hundred percent. A hundred and fifty percent. What's really great is once you find a brand that has your fit, and you can trust their um, quality, you're golden. You know, like if um, Express fits you, oh, your life is easy. But um, but yeah, you're ordering things online. I don't like ordering fabric online. I know you can, and there's ways to do it. And I do, like I've done it and directly from manufacturers and all of that. But you have... Like, some things you don't know until you know you have to feel it. Like, fiber content. I didn't even look at this. Do we have a tag? Is there a tag? There is a tag. I have to count that. So, 35% cotton, 65% polyester. Ooh, 
this is almost the perfect ratio, 60-40. If you are looking at fiber content and you're buying things online or you're buying them in stores, 60-40. Why 60-40? What's 60-40? 60% polyester, 40% cotton. Why 40% cotton and not 60% cotton? Okay, so polyester does not wrinkle and it lays and has a good drape to it. Why 40% cotton and not 60% cotton? Okay, so polyester does not wrinkle and it lays and has a good drape to it, but it does not breathe. Cotton breathes, but it wrinkles like crazy. And it also shrinks up and gets wider. So a pure cotton garment is going to get short and wide. So if you're always wondering why when you buy a shirt, it gets shorter and a little bit wider, it's because cotton, cotton cells absorb the water and they get a little wider and fatter, full of the water. And then when they dry up, the cells have kind of just changed that shape. Hi, Spooky. I'm not done yet, but you can come say hi. So to minimize shrinkage and also keep the um, garment from being wrinkly, you want a 60-40% ratio. And it'll be, it's easy to kind of recognize it from there. And you'll start to feel it. When you put a 100% polyester shirt on, it's hot. You you feel like, oh, I can't breathe. This isn't 100% polyester, but it is pretty synthetic. Not all synthetics are the same. Um, I love rayons. They're my favorite. They're cool to the touch. If you get a rayon shirt, especially Hawaiian shirts, you can feel them. They just naturally cold to the touch and they have a different drape to them. Rayon's my favorite fabric, honestly. Favorite fiber content. I have opinions about these things, but... Um, but yeah, when you're looking fiber content in shirts, you can pretty much tell if it's going to be a easy shirt. Spooky. He's mad at me, so he's knocking over my stuff. <laughs> Cats, they're little jerks and I love them. Spooky, I absolutely love you. He's not looking at me now. Okay. Anyways, let me just rip. I didn't want to rip this one off separately, but I want this piece and I don't want it from there because I don't. I'm trying to be lazy and it's not working. When I had to rip things off at the costume shop, we only used razor blades to rip out seams. I know it's dangerous, but it was fast. <laughs> Spooky telling you you've been streaming too long. Feed me, human. Yes, actually, he knows that I'm supposed to be leaving in about 15 minutes. So he knows it's time. This Actually, here's my question. Has daylight been saved? We just had daylight savings time. And my cat's... He thinks that we're all off and it's bothering him. It really is. All right, let me get this off, and then I almost have this thing in pieces, and then we can count how many pieces we have. Okay. Oh, they didn't stitch them individually. They just folded it. That's the easier, cheaper way to do it if you have those fancy machines to pleat. They're not stitched individually. They're just folded. I love it. This is about how tight I did the pleats for the Princess Leia helmet, but I did box pleats. So this is another pattern piece. And we had the center front on both sides and the placket on both sides. And I just ripped out two seams and the hem seam. So now that this shirt is shredded and in pieces, let's count how many. Seams we have and then how many pieces we have. So we have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 32, 32 seams and 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 pieces for the shirt. 20 pieces, that seems a little high. Like it makes sense, but 
I wasn't expecting that number, were you? I feel like we should do like a hypothesis. How many pieces do we think are going to be in this garment? And we'll see how close we are in the end because you have to think about interfacings. You have to think about left and right sides, etc. Okay, but this thing is in pieces. We know how many, 32 seams and 20 pieces, dang, okay. Um. <laughs> All right, guys, it's been long enough. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this live stream. It's been a fun project. It's time for me to go. I got to get going next week. Let's do the best. See you next Tuesday around the same time, 3 o'clock-ish, 3, 15, 3, 30. We'll figure out. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. And extra.